Welcome, everybody. We will be discussing some introductory topics in relation to our course on chicagonosis.org. As you can see from our turnout tonight, that this is a pretty compelling topic. But there are also many misunderstandings that often are associated with these principles in a theological sense, especially. We often think of fate as in fatality. And we think of free will in terms of our limited experience. We'll talk a lot today about the nature of fate, free will, and also divine forgiveness, not from a theoretical perspective, from a philosophical standpoint. We'll talk about it from an experiential perspective because in our studies, the term gnosis in Greek means knowledge from experience. It's what we live. It is what we verify. Despite the fact that we'll mention so many writers and, you know, even theologians on this topic, some particular points of view that have been documented in our world's literature, even poetry, scripture, about the nature of fate, free will, and mercy. I hope by the end to leave you with some understanding of the principles of these truths that can inform how we navigate life. More importantly, these principles are practical. There's something that we can experience within our very being, within our consciousness, and not merely leave it as a theory, as a belief, something to uphold in the mind or conviction in the heart, but without evidence. So our focus today will talk about destiny. One moment, we're making someone a co-host again. Our focus today is going to be precisely about some fundamental principles. We'll examine the relationship between fate and free will, which obviously we know from our humanity's legacy, from scripture and writings and philosophy, is often very tense. There's a nuance and dynamic relationship between the nature of destiny and also our agency. We'll also talk about the very famous term karma. We'll talk about its nature, its notoriety, right? Basically, in synthesis, we can say it's cause and effect, action and consequence. And we'll talk about the often misunderstood principle of spiritual action and also its results in our life. We'll also talk about grace from a divine perspective and the role of the human individual in developing a personal relationship with divinity. Also, it is about expanding our own agency, how we act, what we can do, in the particulars and challenges of our own life. Lastly, we'll explain what real freedom is, what it means to have divine intercession, and also the famous term redemption from a psychological, from a spiritual perspective. Now, when we talk about destiny, we talk about divine law. We talk about realities that are beyond belief not in the superstitious sense, 
but realities that are eternal, that belong to nature, to the cosmos, to the individual. When we talk about divine law, we mean precisely in the same way we talk about gravity. There are laws that govern nature, the universe, and also our psychology. There are laws that relate to how divinity acts within humanity, within all the infinite and the many infinites. This can help clarify some common misconceptions about the nature of divine agency, especially when we are examining our own life and how to develop that personal relationship with divinity. That knowledge of experience of the truth is gnosis, the Greek term for divine wisdom, what we live. And when we experience what divinity is, such as through practice like meditation and awakening in dreams, we perceive that there are laws that operate within divine reality and divine realms. They are profound and eternal. They do not waver. They do not conform to our prejudices, our preconceptions, what we want. They simply are. And in the same way that these laws exist in terms of how we can, you know, navigate life or in the sense of gravity, how we exist in this world. There are laws that once fulfilled within our consciousness, within our practice, within our efforts, they, re they result in the fruition of divine experience, a deeper connection with profound divine states like compassion, altruism, faith, which is knowledge from experience, real love, real patience. These are psychological and spiritual qualities that resonate with higher principles. And so these laws, really, the divine law in itself, is precisely what any spiritual seeker strives towards in any religion, no matter what culture or creed. And it is in aspiring towards higher laws that we seek to change our own mistaken ways of being. Now, in the West, we have a common misconception that divinity somehow, in a sense, can basically do what he wants or do what she wants, depending on the tradition, Eastern or Western. But the reality is that even divinity obeys the laws set forth within the um, higher regions of nature, higher ways of being. In this process, of seeking divinity in our own life and overcoming the causes of suffering and seeking to improve our lives, we come to recognize that we have a choice and that in relationship to higher laws, ways of being, ethical conduct, superior ways of acting in life, we have to make a choice, not in the future and not in the past, but now. We have a choice, moment by moment, when we are criticized or slandered or hurt or betrayed. We have to watch and examine our heart. What will we do? How will we behave? What will we accomplish in such a moment? This is free will, obviously, right? We have a choice. And the very fact that we have the potential to choose in moments of great crises emphasizes to us the nature of a compassionate divinity. Because a divinity that would simply have us do what he wills or she wills or what 
we call the being in our Gnostic studies. If the being were to force the individual to do what it wants, really, it'd be merely a, a tyrant. There'd be no relationship. We'd be like a robot, a machine. When really divinity is a conscious state of being, very free and very profound and very unlimited, very dynamic. Moment by moment, we can learn to access that. And so, again, the choice is ours. Do we learn to follow the inclinations of the heart, an intuitive understanding that knows right from wrong, conscience? Or do we follow our own whims, our personal desires, our habits, our attachments? There's a script, there's a, a really an epic poem in English called Paradise Lost. I'm sure some of you have heard this about this work by John Milton. Very famous uh, work of literature, which many people have studied for centuries. It's a very beautiful and profound, really um, poetic narration of the fall in Eden, according to the Bible. And it's the foundation of you know many Judeo-Christian worldviews. Even in Islam, you know, they talk about really the fall of the rebel angels and the fall of humanity in a foregone time, which are very beautiful symbols of internal psychological and spiritual truths. John Milton, particularly in book three of Paradise Lost, explains the nature of a divine and compassionate creator. And this creator is not something foreign or outside of us. This divinity or this law, this conscience, this voice of real wisdom, which speaks in the silence of the mind and the heart, is internal. And this law, this truth, this way of being, which is profoundly intelligent and wise, really still gives us the choice whether to follow it or our desires. And this poem really, you know, in this book three of the Paradise Lost explains in the voice of the Father, in Milton's depiction, the voice of divinity speaking to a host of angels about the nature of choice and the autonomy of the soul. And that without freedom to choose, there would be no virtue. There would be no opportunity to grow. There would be no wisdom. Divinity would be a tyrant, as I said. And there'd be no freedom to be. What better response is there than to be given a choice and to be persuaded by our own conscience to follow the freedom of the heart? It's, it's a funny paradox, right? I mean, our conscience is like a law. It tells us what to do. And if we obey it, we find freedom. You know it in your conscience and your being when we do what is right. We feel strength. We feel fulfillment. We feel peace. And when we break that law, we suffer. We enter anarchy chaos, pain. And so the father in this lines from book three talk about how the father is explaining the nature of free will and that we have to decide what we want because people obviously blame God, right? You, you hear from people who've been through some church or synagogue or mosque, any faith in which they felt traumatized whether it's by a world war, persecution, the failings of the clergy, spiritual trauma, abuse, betrayal. And so people look at religion and say, there is no divinity because we see by poor example 
from others really what should not be. And so the father here in the poem explains and abdicates himself of really the failures of the human individual. In talking about the fallen angels, he says, so will fall he and his faithless progeny, whose fault, whose but his own, ingrate, he had of me all he could have. I made him just and right, sufficient to have stood, though free to fall. Such I created all the ethereal powers and spirits, both them who stood and them who failed. Freely they st stood who stood and fell who fell. Not free, what proof could they have given sincere of true allegiance, constant faith or love? where only what they needs must do appeared, not what they would. What praise could they receive? What pleasure I from such obedience paid, when will and reason, reason also is choice, useless and vain, of freedom both despoiled, made passive both, had served necessity, not me. They therefore as to right belonged, so were created, nor can justly accuse their maker or their making or their fate as if predestination overruled their will disposed by absolute decree or high foreknowledge they themselves decreed their own revolt not i if i foreknew for knowledge had no influence on their fault which had no less proved certain unforeknown so to kind of break down the english here he's basically saying that yes as divinity, the divine is omniscient and sees all, understands everything. And as for knowledge, that can anticipate what will come. But despite knowing what will happen, in a sense, divinity says, you have a choice. You have your will. And real growth occurs when we align our will with divinity, willingly, voluntarily in our life. Otherwise, as it was explained earlier in these verses, how is it possible to show real allegiance and love? Love does not grow under the whip. One has to be willingly devoted to our inner divinity. But obviously, you know, people criticize these verses, especially in a Universities, especially if you take a, a course on Milton, where people are very jaded, sour, morbid. And they think, well, why didn't divinity just force me to do the right thing? Well, this is why. We can't be forced. We have to choose. We have to act because we have a spark of divine agency, which must learn to grow and develop and to be nurtured, and to be fed. So, instead of looking at fate as something fatal or mechanical, it's really managed with intelligence. He continues, So without least impulse, or shadow of fate, or aught by me immutably foreseen, they trespass, authors to themselves and all, both what they judge and what they choose. For so I form them free, and free they must remain, till they enthrall themselves. I else must change their nature, and revoke the high decree, unchangeable, eternal, which he ordained their freedom. They themselves ordained their fall. Really, um, simply put, when we are infatuated by our own desires, we judge mistakenly. And we become the author of our own pain. But we have the potential, the freedom, you know, until we enthrall ourselves, we become hypnotized by what we want a priori, our prejudices, our attitudes, our appetites, our desires. And divinity cannot break this law. Divinity established the law for a reason, these higher principles. And really, to force the unwilling 
in a sense, is to revoke the high decree, which is unchangeable. It is eternal, which basically allows the potential and opportunity for real freedom. But we enter suffering because we choose to. So in a practical sense, we can relate this all to what is known as the fates, according to the Greek myths. You know, we have uh, three women who are symbols of divine law. We have Clotho the spinner, Lachesis the allotter, Atropos the unturning. Often people are, or the fates are associated with these women or fe female figures who operate a, you know, who spin yarn and that this thread is a life of individual beings. Even the gods are, are measured by the fates. And this is very interesting. So in the myth, you have Clotho who spins the yarn, Lachesis who measures the length of the thread, and Atropos who cuts. And this is a symbol of a person's lifespan. You know, we obviously have a measurement of life in terms of the length of the cloth, and the cutting is death. Now in the myth, it's often related that Zeus is the only one who sometimes has the same authority as the fates, but all the other gods are subjected to these three women. This is very profound. It corroborates what Milton taught. Divinity cannot break his own laws and operates in accordance with cause and effect. It is by understanding cause and effect how our actions produce our life where we can develop real wisdom in which we can consciously manage our situation. And rather than suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, to quote Hamlet, we can take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them, we do so with intelligence. We take advantage of our life and we learn to operate under a higher law. Now, what's interesting is that these fates, these women, represent divine intelligence. The fates are not some arbitrary dispenser of blind justice and that they're simply choosing willy-nilly in a metaphorical sense who lives and who dies at a certain time. Really, and this is a very complex issue, these things are governed by intelligence with wisdom. And in fact, fate what may happen or what could happen or what should and will happen is consciously managed. In that way, we can understand that really, as we're going to explain a little bit later, fate or karma, the Sanskrit word for cause and effect, action, the law can be negotiated. It can be negotiated because there is intelligence behind all the happenings of life. These are not merely some superstition. This is something that we can verify. We can experience. Now, in the, really the plethora of events in our life, really we are faced with a lot of options, right? You know, we have challenges and ordeals and, and crises even. Maybe at our job, maybe in our marriage, maybe in our career, with our family, with friends. There's a sea of potential. And all this is symbolized in the 69th Arcanum of the Eternal Tarot. You may notice from our lectures that we build on a lot of traditions because we're trying to get it at the heart of what they all mean practically. And how we can apply their principles for really improving our lifestyle. So the tarot are often depicted as Egyptian symbols, cards, right? I mean, fortune tellers, you know, we have, a, unfortunately, a abuse of the tradition that, you know, historically has been passed on in terms of 
you know, fortune tellers and all that. But really, as we see here from the Eternal Throw deck available through Gorian Publishing, we have art and iconography, which is very beautiful and profound and relates to the notion of fate. So, you know, as you see in this image, we have a, a male figure in a kind of a tunic or a cloth holding his hand over his eyes and he's trying to feel his way blindly. This is us. In our life, we may feel blind. We may not know divinity. We have a problem, a situation we don't know how to solve. We have a difficulty at work, a conflict. Maybe we're being challenged. We feel lost. We look for answers. We look to spirituality. We look to books. We look to scriptures to teach us how to resolve the problems of daily living. And surrounded by a sea of options, as I said, we become very overwhelmed. We're in chaos. We are in the arcanum of chance. However, what's very beautiful about this image is that you see the Egyptian goddess Newt reclining over the initiate or disciple. She is a representation of the divine feminine or the divine mother of all religions. You can call her Athena, Diana, Shekinah, Kundalini. She has many names. Miriam, Mary. She's not something outside of us. She is inside our heart. She is the divine presence or intelligence of our conscience who guides us through the heart. And as we walk blindly, she still protects her child. She protects her child as he, he or she wanders, trying to feel for a solution. So the question is, how do we face potential? This card has some very interesting explanations that are pertinent to this discussion. So every arcanum or law, better said, is the Latin term for, you know, these higher realities, divine law. Arcana means plural for laws themselves. Each arcanum has some explanations related to them that can offer us insight. Chance as a law known by the instinct. This is very interesting, right? I mean, we know situations in our life instinctually when we're really up in the air. And this is the emotional feeling we get when we receive this card, such as through our reading in our, in our homes or in meditation or in dreams. Really, there's a lot of potential out there. And then we know by instinct, by just reaction, that there's a lot at stake, you know? We're looking for a solution. We're trying to solve it. We can't. The solution is in the next verse. Symbolizes the human virtue of transcendental knowledge. Right? That's why we go to books and scriptures and everything. Because we want some higher knowledge to teach us about what to do. But importantly, in relation to this card, this transcendental knowledge is not from a book. It's from meditation. It's when you reflect on how your own life relates to a certain struggle and you seek in a state of serenity for the solution, for the insight. That knowledge can come to us when the mind is still and we can receive through images in our imagination with clarity what to do. Now, kind of corroborating some of the earlier points about the Divine Mother, we find that in terms of this card, it is associated to the planet Venus, the letter M. And the number six, Venus obviously is the goddess of love, our divine mother. The letter M, Mary, Miriam in Hebrew. And the number six, if you study the Torah, you know that the sixth arcanum is indecision, right? Another disciple who's caught between two women, looking left, ignoring the divine mother on the right. We're stuck with a choice. This card relates chance, relates to indecision, right? You know, you have many options. You don't know what to do. You're indecisive. So really, 
in those moments, we have to rely on our divine mother, our heart, our conscience. This is because it represents the principle of the primary faculties as guidance in the way of life. What are these primary faculties? Intuition, Dis discrimination, discernment. You know, it's not an intellectual faculty. You have a problem. Your mind tries to wander and get scared. Think up solutions, panicking for what am I going to do? How do I solve this? The intellect is not a primary faculty. It's not the most important. The heart is more important. The heart can resolve problems easily if we calm the mind and if we listen and wait. This is because in relation to the transcendental axiom, this law of this arcanum, cause and effect is certain. What we do will have consequences and those consequences will have later causes. As it says here, there is a fruit in any labor and there is a labor in any fruit. So the chance is, you know, we may make a mistake, but the real labor is following our heart. This card also emphasized some points about forecasting. So what's interesting is that every arcanum has a element of prediction, kind of tells you what may happen maybe in a future moment in relation to a problem or situation, especially if you do a reading. As an element of prediction, it promises retributions, compensations, satisfactory changes, opportunity for ranking ascension, success in real estate properties, thoughtless accomplishment of wish wishes, fortuitous attractions. So basically all this is pointing to is the nature of cause and effect. Karma. This is a Sanskrit word for action and consequence. It is certainty. It is knowing that, you know, in our heart, the right way of acting in a situation will produce compensation, positive rewards, maybe retributions, obviously, right? I mean, nothing is always, always good or bad, but a mixture. You know, there's good and the bad and bad and the good, according to Saman Vior, the founder of our tradition. So cause and effect, right? We hear of karma, we think of, you know, you're going to get what you deserve, right? Or what goes around comes around. You know, that person was a real jerk at work, so they're going to they're going to get what's coming to them, you know? And in a sense it's true, right? Cuz you know, people talk and reputations spread and people know. You find out pretty quickly, you know, or over time, right? A person's true character. You know, not merely just the gossip, but in essence, really, when we talk about karma, we're talking about, you know, those laws that govern everything, our relationships, our psychology, countries, humanity, worlds, infinites. More important than just physical action is the state of our mind, which is the most important thing to think about when we examine, you know, the nature of cause and effect of fate, you know. Really, um, I know we think of it as blind retribution, right? That karma is something blind or unjust, arbitrary, right? And there's some uh, credence to this feeling, right? Because, you know, there's some pretty bad things that happen to people who are good. And there are some pretty, you know, good things that happen to people who are bad. And so we look at the situation in our current life and we we think, why is this? Why does this happen? Why are the just punished and the criminals get away? In reality, our perspective is very limited. We don't see the full picture. You know, and we talk a lot about in our studies how, you know, our consciousness can expand, can awaken, can it develop to a degree that we're able to investigate, you know, the root of certain situations, you know? and examine and understand the causes of certain effects in life, not merely from this physical existence, but something even deeper, like in dreams and visions and meditation, you know, even previous existences, you know, 
And it doesn't have to be something theoretical or belief, something we investigate, something we look for. So karma, you know, it's a uh, cause and effect. And there are levels. And more importantly, when we study karma, we're not studying it as some, you know, negative thing. It applies to all causes and, and conditions and effects. We study karma because, in truth, we want to fulfill superior action and to understand why we are in the situation that we're in in life. And no one can tell us that. No one can teach us that. That's something we have to discover. You know, why do we suffer a certain relationship or situation or or illness or whatever it may be? You know, we can investigate the root causes of these phenomena and understand, you know, where we're at and also where we need to go. Now, impo more importantly, when we study karma, you know, cause and effect, this has to do with our own individual agency, right? So I know we talked about kind of like fate and, you know, being in a certain situation in life. Maybe we want to understand why we're here. The way that we discover it is by understanding five principles of karma. The first four were given by Song Kapa in his Lam Rim. It's a great Tibetan treatise of Mahayana Buddhism. He's a very great master of that tradition. He explains, you know, these four principles initially are what, you know, help us understand the nature of cause and effect. You know, it's not just something physical. This is something psychological as well, because our mind and our thoughts, you know, really determine everything. Right? You know, we become what we think. If we're in a negative state of mind, we're going to produce situations and consequences for ourselves, which are going to be problematic, you know? And the reason why we study these five principles, especially, is to know how to act more appropriately, right? Follow our conscience, our heart. And by understanding the laws of karma, the principles of karma, better said, we'll have more strength, honestly. Because just as these principles can apply to bad behavior, more importantly, they also apply to good behavior and can result in better, you know, outcomes for ourselves. Because we always follow the trajectory of our own actions, even in our mind stream. The five principles of karma are certainty, magnification, compensation, permanence, and transcendence. In a sense, by following and understanding these five principles, we can learn to develop a deeply personal relationship with our own inner divinity because we understand how our own behaviors you know, affect the world. The first is the certainty of karma. Actions produce related consequences. You know, we have an image here of a, you know, dominoes effect, right? You know, in a sense, you knock over the domino or, you know, it's going to fall and hit the others. Likewise, we know if we get angry at someone, we're probably going to make them angry, right? You know, we know this, but, you know, do we understand that it's wrong? You know, we may know to a degree, right? Intellectually, we tell ourselves, yeah, you know, really should have uh, not said that negative thing to my family member or spouse, right? We may feel a tinge of remorse. Cause and effect is certain, you know? Most likely, you punch someone, you're going to get hit. You're going to get punched back, you know, in a very basic level, right? It's certain. What we don't understand in our depths is how certain psychological behaviors are going to produce consequences for ourselves. If we understood, then we wouldn't do it. You'd comprehend it. It's not knowing. Knowing something is wrong. An alcoholic can know that their addiction is bad, but continue to be an addict, right? Knowledge is very superficial. It's of the intellect. The mind may know something is wrong, may label it, may theorize. But if the heart isn't in it, there's no understanding. And then, you know, we continue to do things that are harmful. You know, maybe we don't feel the results of our actions in this life, but we will feel it. Karma is certain. It's like an imprint in the film of nature. Think of life as like, you know, 
in a sense, you may have heard of kind of a new agey concept of a, what is it? The Akashic Records, right? Some of you may have heard of this, how every action in life is recorded in uh, higher realities or higher dimensions. We've talked about some of this in our Dream Yoga course. The Quran talks about how every action will be written in a book. It's the same metaphor that divinity sees all action and that our actions will produce consequences. Maybe not immediately, but it will come to fruition at some point. And if we wish to cultivate a psychological space of serenity, we should learn to stop performing harmful actions because karma is certain. There are effects. We don't live in a bubble where we can think and feel whatever we want. We affect everyone. You know this when you go to a meeting or you're talking with someone and they're angry. They may not say anything, but you feel it. So think of this. Certainty of karma. Cause and effect is certain. But there's also other laws. The magnification of karma. Contrary to belief, common belief, the consequences are actually greater than the actions. This may seem strange. You know, we think of Newtonian physics like every action has an equal and opposite reaction. But the truth is that every action is magnified in nature. Think of it like dropping a stone in a lake. The ripples reach out to all of the pond. And every living thing in it feels the disturbance. In the same way, you know, you have a politician or an angry person gets on a podium and speaks very negative things. Their words are recorded on, you know, X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it now. You know, YouTube, podcasts, media, those words are magnified because they reach more people. And that one angry person now becomes a group of millions of angry people. The consequences are by far greater than the initial action. Actions expand. Now, more hopefully for us is that this is not something, you know, just negative, but, you know, you do a good deed. It, it reaches out to people. Our communities are benefited when we are upright. We perform things that are of benefit to our immediate members, our clients whom we work with, our families. Really, I mean, when we're performing good deeds and acting uprightly, you know, that has a ripple effect. It reaches out. It expands. It's contagious. Also, we have to understand the compensation of karma. We have an image here of like a, you know, pendulum, right? In essence, you cannot receive the consequence without committing its corresponding action. Some people think, uh, you know, mistakenly that if, um, you know, karma can be shared, but this negates the principle of individual agency. If someone, if a man, the husband commits murder, does the wife go to jail? You know, it's like other people can't pay our karma for us. It's something individual, really, strictly speaking in a fundamental sense, you know, other people cannot basically be our karma for us. We have to do so willingly. We cannot receive the consequence without committing its action. You know, it's like you hit a pendulum, right? It goes back and forth in the sense that we propel the action, the action come back comes back to us. And it's very important to understand this principle because, you know, I know some traditions teach that other people or someone else can save us. This is a very much a Christian dispensation. But in reality, no one can save us but our own actions. We have to fulfill the necessary requisite causes for our own redemption for our own change. Our own inner divinity, represented as symbolized by Christ, can save us, but not any outside person, inside. 
we have to fulfill the law because we are compensated based on our actions. If we do it, we will reap the benefit. If we don't, only we suffer the consequences. But obviously, we can, you know, bring others down in the meantime. You know, if we're really, really quite sw- sour, morbid. Also, karma is permanent. Once an action is performed, the consequence cannot be erased. This is both good and bad connotations. You can't take back a bullet. You fired the gun. You can't take it back. Likewise, a negative word cannot be cannot be retracted or redacted. If we do something wrong, we have to suffer the consequences. It's permanent. You can't forget it. You may maybe you do forget it, but you know, in a sense, you can't erase it. It happened. This should give us pause. What actions on our part are we willing to live with? Really, should we live with the consequences of saying a hurtful thing to the people we love? Or should we be patient, understand our own agitation, and seek to be the best that person we can, promote the well-being of our community, of our loved ones? However, this also has a positive connotation too, because you know, you do a good deed. Really, it you know it's permanent. People will remember. People always remember the person who is kind, who is altruistic, who is patient, who is giving consistently. That's permanent. You cannot erase those consequences. You know, unless you really work hard at you know going against that. More importantly, you know, to go beyond Sankapa's explanations about karma. We have a fifth principle that is related to us by Salman Vior, especially in his book, Tarun Kabbalah. He explained that a superior action overcomes an inferior one. This is very beautiful and profound. You know, given that karma is permanent, you know, it might seem fatal. Like you do something wrong, you can't erase it. I mean, you can't take it back, but in a sense, there is redemption within the law. A superior way of being always overcomes an inferior one. Say, for example, you hurt someone with your speech. Later, you are genuine, you have remorse, you go back and you apologize. And not only that, you do something good for that person. You act for their benefit. You're really repentant. And you mend the relationship. You heal it. You make it grow. And someone who was once an enemy can really become a friend. This is the real meaning behind Christian transcendence or redemption. And this is an action that is really, you know, represented within all religions, but we find especially and beautifully represented by Jesus, how a superior law can overcome an inferior one. An eye for an eye is replaced with mercy. In a sense, we all need this because, you know, we have many faults. We need a higher power and a higher principle to guide us. That superior action comes from within the heart when our own inner divinity is expressing through us. When we empty our mind and our heart, our preconceptions, our appetites, our desires, and become still, even if but for a moment, in which the real being can express the real power of divinity. And that is the power of transcendence. Because our own inner divinity, our own conscience knows how to act and even to mend our mistakes. So there is a higher law. And it is this higher law that guides us, you know, when we're trying to change. So here we have an image of St. Paul and St. James. You know, they have very different perspectives that we're going to synthesize here. Both are right. But unfortunately, within some uh, Christian denominations, there's a great argument about whether or not one is saved just by grace or is saved just by works. In truth, we need both. And it's a very interesting interplay of principles that is something we can only verify through our own practice. So I believe James said that really, you know, we have to do certain works. You know, there's cause and effect, there's karma. 
we have to put certain causes in action that are going to produce the changes that we want. And that mere belief without the fruit of effort is dead, as he says. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So here he means belief, you know, you know, just thinking a tradition or, you know, scripture is true, but not really living it within the heart. And if we don't act upon what we learn or study or meditate upon, you know, our spirituality is ineffective. It doesn't produce anything. That's the measurement. But also as we're working in ourselves, there's also, you know, the element of grace too, right? You know, we need forgiveness. That forgiveness is not from someone outside, but from our own inner God, our divine mother, or the divine father, the being. Grace is an interesting concept, really, but in practice, it's when we receive help. You know, we can't fundamentally change our deepest, you know, habits and errors and mistakes on our own. We do our part, and it's a major part, but it's not everything. We need grace, you know, we need blessings from our own inner being strength within our heart guidance insight that grace often comes in the form of dreams you know if you've studied our course on dream yoga and astral travel we teach how to meditate put the body in a state of suspension relax awake the consciousness fall asleep physically but maintain your mindfulness and then in the screen of your imagination you start to see images you start to dream but consciously and you can start to see things that you know are beyond the physical world. And you receive help from your own inner divinity through certain visions, symbolic experiences. We need these visions as a balance. We need to work for them to change what we can in our daily life, but also learn to be meditators and to change psychologically so that in the clearness of our mind, we can get superior guidance. This is why Paul Tarsus states in Ephesians, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. It's a delicate, nuanced thing. You know, these two verses seem to contradict each other, but we need both. We have to work to have faith, you know, develop conscious experience in ourselves of what these realities are practically. Not belief, not to think or feel something is true, but not to know. And we have to learn to have those experiences patiently so that we get guidance and that, you know, we can't do this on our own. We need help. So in relation to karma, you know, there's three ways to pay it. You know, we have a lot of debts, we can say, in a spiritual sense. We've committed many actions in our past, not only in this life, you know, if you study this tradition for some time, we talk about previous lives, so that we can experience and meditate and verify. We can say that there's three ways to pay karma. One is obviously with pain. Two, good deeds. And three, real repentance. We have an image here of Ganesha, when Hinduism is the divinity associated or principle associated with obstacles and their remedies. He's depicted as an elephant. He has a key here because he has the key to knowledge, real knowledge, real experience. Our inner divinity gives us challenges. You know, how else can we prove ourselves that we want to you know, really perfect our livelihood, our life, our lifestyle? to be a better member of our community. But also, divinity provides the solutions, right? So Ganesha is both obstacle giver and solution giver. That's the role of divinity, to teach us how to grow. We need challenges so that we see our own mistakes that we created so that we can change them. This is a gift from divinity. Salman Vera stated in a lecture called False Personality, Patience, Repentance, and Forgiveness, about these three ways of paying karma, you know, the residue of our past actions. 
Karma is not only paid with pain. Karma can also be paid with good deeds. And even forgiveness can be achieved through supreme repentance. And then the causal egos are dissolved. So, you know, commonly most people go through life who have no inclination of, you know, changing themselves fundamentally. They pay with painful situations, you know. They murder in one life, they're murdered in the next. They steal from someone in one lifetime. They're stolen, you know, someone steals from them in this existence. It's a blind, mechanical, repetitive, cyclical thing, you know, and it oftentimes gets compounded and exacerbated by our own anger and, and fear and impatience in the moment. We make things worse. We just continue the cycle. However, as I was explaining earlier, with the trans transcendence of karma, karma can also be paid with good deeds. You can negotiate, right? It's not just something blind you got to suffer through, but you can ask for even credit from divinity and say, I want to do, you know, if you provide me with these things, you know, of spiritual benefit, I will perform A, B, and C in return. You know, and doing good deeds, in a sense, offers us credit. It's like a bank. You pay off your debts, you're relieved. <laughs> Pretty sure people who've had college debt feel the same way. But, you know, uh, in a sense, in a spiritual sense, it's the same thing. We pay our karma with good deeds. Lastly, you can even pay karma with eliminating the defects that are related with the crime, you know, or the or the error. In a sense, if you really comprehend and disintegrate, you know, anger, for example, that caused a certain marital problem in a past life or current situation, you don't have to face the karma of it. You know, what would happen if that anger continued to live like a demon, you know, feeding off our own mistakes? There's a way to repent, and that's, you know, comprehending and eliminating our errors, psychologically speaking. We call them egos defects vices desires in a deep sense when the causes of those egos are eliminated you have real peace that's another way you know so there's three ways in synthesis that way if you pay your debts it's like you know in a sense we develop a more personal relationship with divinity who manages all of that so some question people might have asked in the past is you know how much free will do we really have you know, it is a bit dark, honestly. Salman Vera mentions that 97% of our consciousness tends to be trapped, you know, conditioned within elements like anger and pride and fear. And the best part of us is, you know, in a sleeping state, inactive, trapped, conditioned. Every defect, like anger or pride or fear, is a cage. You know, it traps us in that habit and processes the consciousness in accordance with that condition. So the consciousness trapped in anger will only act with anger. Pride with pride, fear with fear. And because those desires are so strong, we just tend to repeat them. You know, 97% of our mind is like that. There's very little of us that is free still. You know, we say that there's 3% consciousness that is not yet trapped with an ego. And this might seem very daunting and, you know, pessimistic. You know, it is a very dark thing. But look at the story of David and Goliath in the Bible. David, the free consciousness, with a stone and his faith, killed a giant. Killed his desires, his defects. Conquered himself in battle. It could be done. But, you know, we have to learn to activate the will that we still have, the free will left in our disposal to be able to act on the conditioned consciousness and liberate what's trapped there so that we expand and grow and develop the capacity to act freely more and more. Salman Ver kind of emphasizes these points in, uh, or the reality of our situation here in a talk on the mysteries of life and death. There is a small space of free will, but it is very small. Imagine for a moment a violin inside its case. There's very little space for that violin to move around. That is like the space our free will has to move in, which is almost nothing. So there's only a small space for free will, almost imperceptible. Yet if we know how to use it, then it is possible for us to transform ourselves radically 
and become liberated from the law of recurrence. But it is necessary to know how to take advantage of it. How? The solution is to study our psychology and to understand the dynamics of karma. So if we wish to develop a more personal relationship with our own inner divinity, to expand our potential of free will, to liberate the consciousness, to free ourselves from suffering, you can study two works. Treaties of Revolutionary Psychology by Samal Viora and the book Karma is Negotiable, Destiny and the Divine Power of Love, available on Glorian Publishing. These two books will provide a basis for first examining our own situations in life, understanding in us what part of us is free and what can change. These books are very radical in the sense that they offer a practical basis for approaching, you know, the problems of life so that, you know, by learning to endure the, you know, challenges of our current existence and by learning to respond to them with efficacy, with ethics, with love, with understanding, we can make great changes, you know, and produce causes that are going to be beneficial for us and others in a deep and lasting way. At this point, I invite you to ask questions. Hi there. Thank Hello. You. You're welcome. Hi. My question is, when we are exercising, making the decisions that you talked about earlier in the lecture, would that be us working with some of that 3% willpower and, and engaging with with that does that make sense yes so basically um really the most fundamental practice we use is meditation there's a specific meditation that you know we teach from books like revolution of the dialectic especially by Samal and vior it's called retrospection meditation or blue time or rest therapeutics more specifically in the practice, after, as we're observing ourselves throughout the day, you know, we're watching our mind, examining our heart, looking at our actions, you know, not just physically, but I mean, in a psychological sense, we're gathering data about our own defects. We watch ourselves. As we're acquiring data about our own habits of mind, we learn to sit down, we relax, calm the mind, calm the body, and call upon the screen of your awareness the events of the day. You try to imagine what you saw, what you thought, what you felt. The purpose is not to just relive the experience and get sucked in, right? Not to get angry or upset with a situation, but to watch it dispassionately. You call upon the screen of your imagination, the events and what you perceived factually, not what you assumed or what you wish it could be, but what it was. You imagine it. You can review at night, you know, right before you go to sleep, you sit, you visualize the events of the day from the morning up to that point. And you examine in the screen of your imagination the defects that you witnessed. This is why self-observation, you know, mindfulness, watching yourself repeatedly, moment by moment, every day is really fundamental because we're trying to gather, you know, food for meditation. You know, you saw maybe in a moment of at work, you felt angry at someone and then maybe you were scared. Oh, what if this person rejects me? You know, there's thoughts and feelings and impulses to act. And maybe um, pride came next. Oh, I don't deserve to be treated this way. And there's a, you know, a, a transaction of different errors that come up. And so, you know, we're studying all these interactions in ourselves, you know, but first you got to see it. You got to watch it, discover it in the moment. Later, you sit down to retrospect. You call upon the screen of your imagination what happened. And you try to go deep 
into those specific defects that we saw with comprehension and with you know patient application of the technique you wait for the answer you look at the ways that maybe this defect is fed you can even see where it came from what it wants how it traps our consciousness how it relates to other defects other egos and then with patient you know application we gain deeper understanding about each error and what the benefits would be if we eliminate them you know and then we pray to our inner divine mother kundalini to eradicate them i mean that's a, that's a very basic you know you know surface level explanation but i invite you to study on our website the lecture in a series on gnostic meditation the last lecture is all dedicated to this this practice it's called retrospection meditation if we meditate and eliminate defects you take the mechanical errors that you know perpetuate our suffering and you destroy them you free the consciousness that's trapped there and little by little we start to have more free will we stop being mechanical we stop repeating the same mistakes and you know that this is effective when you know you face the same situations in life and you don't react at all the same way you used to you know and personally you know i've had a job that's been pretty challenging very difficult and just working on certain defects of impatience and fear and anger at the situation to suddenly the point that i don't respond or react the same way i used to and people notice you know and there's been a lot of benefits and changes so i've had more freedom and free will as a result of you know reflecting on certain errors of my own that's the method you know study that lecture we'll apply it in the chat for you it's a retrospection meditation very deep hope that answers your question thank you so much wonderful yeah you're welcome So there was another hand raise. I mean, we have a question in the chat. How does one know that one is paying for a karma in the present lifetime or past lifetimes? It's a deep question, you know. There isn't a blanket answer. I mean, in the sense, you know, meditation is really the answer, you know. You have to meditate on what the event is and especially if it's a very deep suffering you know a very deep pain a problem that repeats consistently maybe throughout our whole lifetime you know situation from situation is there there's a recurrence there probably means that we're repeating a very deep error from other lifetimes just in general as a general principle you know you know we can pay for a karma in our present lifetime and we'll know it when we have visions in our dreams especially dreams of being paid money you know is a very good sign is it you know they're saying that basically yeah you're paying for a certain debt you know we're, we're actually paying you dharma and you can be shown in your inner experiences that it's in relation to paying certain debts but you know in terms of paying karma really I'd say that the deeper the problem, you know, the recurrence, it's something common that happens all the time in, you know, certain avenues of life. You know that you're paying it when, you know, you can be verifying it in meditation, especially and in dreams. But also when you know that, you know, your life is changing. Um especially if it's very deep you know that if it's from past lifetimes you'll know it when uh you know if it's very influential you know there's some situations in our lives that are just you know like maybe we someone has a problem with money or someone has a problem with you know being angry you know and maybe that's their chief defect chief, chief characteristic you know some of us have certain defects which are very deeply ingrained with karmic debts and we tend to repeat those the most um those tend to be you know have deeper roots and other existences because they're very ancient 
you know, we've, we've fed them a lot, but, you know, obviously you can cut it at the roots if you go to the roots. We have a question. Can someone stop being reincarnated to get out of the whole karma thing? <laughs> right. It would be the nice answer to simply get away from it all. Um, yeah. Um, we study a, an image called the tree of life. You know, many of you may be familiar with this. It's a often associated with Judaism, a mystical glyph of 10 spheres from lower regions of matter, energy, and perception to the highest and most divine. These are different dimensions in nature, different levels of being. In a sense, the higher you go, the more divine you realities you reach and the less complexity and suffering there is. In a sense, the further up you go, the more you know aligned with divine law you are, and there's less suffering as a result of karma, less laws. Now, the ultimate goal of our studies is eventually to pay everything we owe. You know, that's the ultimate optimal way of being, but it's also very difficult to do. You know, it would be nice to, you know, kind of retire from life if you could, you know, get out of suffering, even if, but for a little bit, there are spiritual paths that teach that, you know, there's some yogis and practitioners who learn to meditate to the point that, and practice to the point that they enter nirvana, you know, higher dimension, and then they choose not to reincarnate, you know, because they want to enjoy that level of nature, which is very pure and divine. We call it the spiral path. Um, but yeah, it's possible. Like, you know, there's some, you know, beings who can learn to develop themselves to a point that rising up the tree of life into higher dimensions that they learn to stay there and they may choose to incarnate when they want. But usually it's also, you know, temporary because in a sense, you cannot escape karma. You know, there may be a temporary pause and, you know, suffering because you eat, reach elevated states of being. But really, the only as way to get out of karma, meaning to pay all your karma, is to really willingly pay it all. We call that the path of the bodhisattva. It's the path taken by masters like Jesus of Nazareth, Padmasambhava, Buddha, Moses, Krishna. It's a very difficult path because, you know, one has to pay all their debts in one life. It's very intense. And when that karma is paid, you know, you can go higher and higher and leave behind the world of pain. But in a sense, even the gods cannot escape karma. There's cause and effect, even in the higher regions of divinity. It's just different, you know, because it's for gods. We're not at that level, so we're here. We have to work with where we're at and not to avoid it, run away from it. It's better to pay it, you know, consciously. And, you know, when you pay it, you don't suffer anymore. But also it's, you know, could be suffering in the beginning because you take it on voluntarily and it's a challenge. But, you know, it's a delicate thing. So really, you know, levels upon levels of work, right? I suggest if you're interested in learning more about kind of this topic of, you know, reincarnation especially, and what does it mean to reincarnate? Uh, Glorian just recently came out with a, a blog and a podcast about it. Reincarnation is real, but very rare. I suggest you study that. Here's a question. How do you tell the, the difference between virtue and people pleasing? Examine your heart. Watch your emotional center. Is it really in a state of giving to the other person to benefit them? Or do we feel a subtle, you know, prejudice or desire there that wants to be liked? You can only taste it through experience, patiently, observe it, watch it. You know, in a sense, no one can tell you when you're being virtuous or not. You have to see it for yourself. What states in you are different, distinct 
It's like discriminating between the taste of water and wine. You know, psychological states are like that. They're very distinct and have a flavor to them. Some leave a sour taste in our, you know, psychological mouth. Some of them are open and expansive, uplifting, virtuous. Watch your heart and then meditate on what you feel. Hi, thank you for the lecture. You're welcome. I, w I had two questions, both related to the fates. Should I just ask them together? Would that be preferable, or should I ask one at a time? Um, I'd say one at a time, maybe. That might be helpful. Okay. okay, the first was, could you just speak a little more on the terms of the spinner, the allotter, and the unturning? Yeah, so the three fates, yeah, the three fates were related to um, sometimes denominated as past, present, and future, you know, or, you know, I believe the Nordic Norns are often associated with, you know, the three, you know, fates, you know, in terms of our, you know, our lifespan, our life, and the moment of death. In a sense, these are eternal laws. These are principles that govern the nature of being itself. Even Richard Wagner in his Das Rheingold, you know, emphasized, you know, the nature of these three principles and that they govern the life of any individual and also any initiate who is working in, um, you know, the spiritual path itself. Um, more basically, you know, the three fates can apply to our own individual life, you know? In a sense, we say that some parts of our life are predetermined, you know? Things will happen in our lifetime that must happen because we set the causes and conditions for them and that they're going to come to fruition at some point. How we negotiate with it in the present is up to us. It's up to our, you know, our mind, the choices we make, what free will we apply. We also say that, you know, in terms of lifespan, you know, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with Gurdjieff. You know, he talks about them. It was called bobbin canalists, right? Light, you know, life, vital capital. We have certain amount of energies or vital values that, you know, allow us to exist, you know, psychologically, physically, spiritually, in terms of our lifespan. So... You know, we can live short lives because we waste our energy, right? Or we can live long lives because we save it in a basic fundamental sense. In a sense, that's a negotiation we make by living an ethical lifestyle. And that could prolong our life. And, you know, maybe we we're perchance going to die at a certain time due to our former actions. And yet by living an ethical way of being, we prolong our life. Especially um, through the practices that we've been teaching, especially, you know, in relation to the vital energy, you know, the creative energy itself, like the pranayama and, and the perfect matrimony. And then, yeah, it's a negotiative, it's a, it's a process. You negotiate it in terms of what actions we fulfill now to procure a better future. That can also relate to the three fates. Sure. Okay, thank thank you. That gives that gives some good insight. Um, the second question I had about the fates as well was: Is that d directly related to then the three furies, Megara, Electo, and Tisiphone? Is that another functioning? Are they are they a functioning of the fates? Yeah, in a sense, that's uh, there's a um, you know there's that correlation too. The comes sometimes the fates, sometimes the furies. You know, they could be denoted as the furies because in a sense you know when a crisis hits there's a great challenge an ordeal you know fate is like a fury you know we face the consequences of whatever it may be but yeah there is that connotation too okay thank you you're welcome we have a question 
So is it safe to say that all suffering one goes through is related to karma, either this, in this, or past lives? There is no suffering that is outside the law. So, yeah, you know, some situations are the recurrence of previous states. That's something you have to investigate in yourself, especially through meditation and dreams, you know? And, you know, it's not something theoretical or something to believe in, something that you can experience through the techniques given by Salon Vior, especially in some of the meditations we, we provide. You know, retrospection meditation, you know, for example, there are certain uh, exercises you can do. I know there's one mantra we use, Raum Gaum. It's a mantra you can use when you wake up from dreams to remember what you experienced in the nighttime. Also, you can use this mantra and other mantras to remember, you know, the past, way beyond the current spectrum of our physical existence. We'll provide a link in the chat for you, a lecture called How to Remember Dreams. Many of the exercises given there, you know, can relate to that. So, yeah. Something you have to investigate for yourself. We have a question. Does your inner divinity know who your future spouse is? How can one receive answers to this question without allowing fear, emotional anguish, and impatience to cloud these visions? Thank you. You know, that's something you can verify. You know, you can see it, you can experience it. But oftentimes it won't come in the form that you like. The important thing is that when we are practicing meditation and looking for deep answers within ourselves to problems such as this, you have to be willing to perceive the experience without, without attachment. You know, you can have a genuine, authentic experience in meditation, you know, maybe a vision in a dream. And that can be fundamentally objective and real, but it's very easy for the mind, for fear, for attachment, you know, impatience and frustration to want to interpret in a certain way. And there's a very delicate balance to be reached, you know, in terms of opening up to that experience, but also knowing how to interpret it, you know, with clarity, without prejudgment, without assumption.